Sounds good. Sounds good. So here we go. I am going to talk about how to breathe new life into old photos today. And it's funny when I think about, you know, this process, it's, it's more than just technical. It, it, you know, it hits home. I've been a photographer for now over 30 years and going and seeing these old pictures was just incredible for me. Well, let me just go through it and show you the whole process. Cause I know you probably have old pictures well as well. And you want to figure out how you can preserve these images, bring them back to life, share them. So what you have found out today is exactly how to do just that and give them a little twist. So first and foremost, thank you for being here today. I'm super excited to be here and talk about this entire process. I love photography. I live in Tokyo, uh, Tokyo, Japan. So today I'm your sensei. Uh, um, I'm still here right now. And I've been here uh, since the pandemic began. So like uh, my, my last trip to the States uh, before recently was uh, February, 2020. And I was going back and forth almost every month to the States. That was my life until, of course, you know, uh, around March uh, of last year of 2020, that changed everything. I am very active on Instagram. You can look there to find out what's going on in my life almost every single day because I'm posting there all the time. Uh, and today is a big day, in matter of fact, for a lot that's going on in my life. Uh, I'm a Nikon ambassador uh, for the States, for the United States. I've been shooting now again for over 30 years. Love this business. It's been very, very good to me. Um, I've done a lot of advertising, a lot of editorial. I'm known for photographing celebrities. And that's probably what got my name on the map. But of course, we didn't start there. So today I want to talk about my beginning, my roots, and and show a lot of that, my my roots, the first you know few years of my life, and talk about that part of it. But um, throughout my career as a photographer, I've had so many amazing assignments, going all over the world, photographing a lot of different people. Some of those people have uh, become, or some of these images have become like iconic images. Like this one of Tyra is probably my more, I, one of my more iconic images uh, in my career. Um, that I, probably my first picture that really stood out and got me a lot of attention was this image. Uh, this is my first big image after moving to Japan. It's my first shoot, I guess say uh, a month in terms of being here. And this was a big celebrity here in Tokyo when I moved here. Um, she was the hottest person actually in, in Tokyo when I first moved here. So it's my first job. So it welcomed me into this new market. And uh, now I'm just as busy here in Japan as I was in the States, as I still am in the States when I get back to the States here and there. So had a lot of fun, you know, really diving in and meeting people and taking pictures. And, and it never gets old to me. This is the last picture I shot in Vegas before uh, the lockdown. My last trip was to Vegas. Uh, in America for uh, for a photo uh, conference, and I shot this picture. And you know, you might see also that I love light. Light makes a big difference in terms of photography and and creating your own identity with light with your pictures. So I use light for everything. Uh, it's influenced me. It it uh, it moves me. And today we'll be using light in a different way. <laughs> So this is just a little background before we dive into today's session, because there's a lot. So I just want you to know my background before we go into uh, going down this rabbit hole of breathing new life into your pictures. I love photography. I love having you know, the best lights, the best lenses, the sharpest lenses. I love all of that. So I'll talk a little bit about gear today also, because you do need certain gear to do what we're going to talk about today. So I go through that part as well. Um, I have several books out in photography. Uh, actually, they're not photography books. They're just books that contain photography. So this is my first book, Sepia Dreams, which I did uh, now 21 years ago. This one first came out. This is my last book that came out, Future American President, uh, where I went all over America to every state photographing 100 kids uh, and asking them all the question, what would you do if you were a future American president? That's my last book. And I love talking about photography. And that's why we are here today. 
to talk about photography. And maybe you're like me. Maybe you saw pictures when you were a kid. You know, maybe it was your parents' pictures. Maybe it was like an aunt or uncle. But there was something about those first pictures that made all of us fall in love with photography. It became a hobby for many of us. Uh, for some of us, it went on to be more than that. But we all hobby or profession, no matter where you are in you know, the realm of photography or where you are on your journey, we all have something in common. We love the image. And it's special. It's super special. I haven't traveled since you know, February 2020 until a month ago when I got on a plane to go see my family. I got an emergency call that my uh, younger sister uh, who was battling cancer um, was at a place where she was going into hospice. So I immediately jumped on a plane. Now to do that today, I had to first go and get a COVID test to make sure I was uh, negative before I got on the plane show proof of that, and then I got on a plane, and this is what it looks like to fly from Japan to America. The plane was empty. Coming over, there were less than 20 people on the plane, 20, 25 people. Going back, the same thing. It was an empty plane. I've never seen that on an international flight before. I'll probably never see that again. So I'm based in Tokyo again. Let me just talk about that for a second, and I love taking pictures all the time. So I always have a camera with me. And I say that because I took two cameras home with me. I took my lenses, I took my tripod. I just took, you know, standard gear that I would say I take all the time when I'm going anywhere. But on this trip to see my family, and I haven't seen them since 2019, since I've seen my family, I shot over 18,000 pictures. Now, I was there for five weeks. That's still probably definitely a, a, uh, <laughs> a record for me. Over 18,000 images. And I also shot video. I still haven't gone through everything. Um, I've gone through a lot of it, but I haven't gone through everything yet. There's just too many images. And they're special for a different reason, but they're very, very special to me. I went to see my younger sister. So this is me seeing my younger sister when I first arrived and you know, just sitting down, talking and catching up. And I wanted to photograph everything. I was there as she went into hospice. Um, I took pictures of us, you know, even selfies. By the way, those 18,000 pictures, those were real pictures, not, not pictures I'd done with my, my cell phone. Uh, so 18,000 real pictures. So I had a picture of this and in this picture, I'm actually using a remote to take pictures of my sister and I together. I even shot her taking when she was cooking for her family. Um, and you know, when we are taking pictures, we have no idea what they'll mean in the future. We're just taking pictures for the love of it. But this picture now means so much to me because this is my sister's very last time cooking for her family. And I didn't know that at the time when I was taking this picture, but it just means so much to me now because of what it represents. I photographed my mother um, talking to my sister uh, and all of us just sitting around talking about the old days and laughing. And that was, that was so special to me to get all those moments. My family always picks at me for taking pictures because I shoot everything. <laughs> and I do mean everything. So what you see here represents my parents. My mother and father have oatmeal every single morning. My father, he drinks uh, hot cocoa for breakfast, and my mother drinks peppermint tea. So this picture reminds me of my parents. So when I'm shooting pictures, I try to document everything, not just 
the people, but you know, things that represent the people or, or a moment or things that are special to me. I've always done that. It's kind of like, you know, maybe the, the photojournalist part of me to, to document things in a deep way. So I think as a photographer, you're always telling a story. So you need elements to tell a story. So I shoot all of these elements, like this, this, uh, these, this, these, uh, this plaque, the, these the spoon and fork, and these two plates. Here you have this plaque on the wall and these two plates. And these two plates are, uh, they were a gift to my father. My father was an anesthesiologist and uh, my father left that field to become a minister. And when he left, there was a doctor who worked with him. He was Japanese and he gave him these two plates. And this has been in on my family's wall since I was a child. So I took these pictures and it's funny because now I live in Japan. I can read a little bit of kanji and, and speak a little bit of Japanese. So it's just weird to see these pictures that have been a part of my life, all my life. And now they have a different meaning. So to see this and document for me is important. And I think that's important for all of us to document elements of our life, not just the people, but everything around us that reminds us of our life. I documented, you know, going to get my vaccine while I was in the States. I got the vaccine. I got the, I got the Johnson & Johnson uh, Jensen vaccine while I was in the States. So I'm going around taking pictures of the entire process. And then when it's time for me to get my picture taken, this guy who saw me taking pictures says, do you want me to take your picture too? I'm like, yes, please. So I give him my Nikon Z7 II and tell him what to do and how to focus. And he gets the picture. Of, I said, just take as many pictures as possible, take a picture every second. And he does. And I get him getting my vaccine, which, you know, this is a, a special time in history, you know, where the whole world is being vaccinated for, for COVID. So I have this moment as part of my history to, you know, maybe a hundred years from now, pass down like, oh, this is back in 2021 when the people were getting vaccinated for COVID. Um, and that's what we're here to talk about today old pictures and breathing new life into them because one day this will be old. And all the pictures I've showed you before this image will be old pictures years from now, 20 years from now, 50 years from now, whatever. And somebody was gonna look at these pictures and like, wow, oh my God, that was back in 2021? <laughs> Sounds weird to say that now, right? So let's talk about how you breathe new life into old pictures. This is a picture of me when I'm nine months old. I never remember seeing this picture. But when I went home, I'm finding my parents' old pictures and I'm like, oh my goodness, let me start documenting this stuff. So I started taking pictures of everything. Uh, my mother would write on the back of pictures. She put down all the information. So I was born in 1963, April 21st, 1963. It was my birthday. And here I am, you know, nine months into life and my mother and I, and I, I just love this picture. My mother was great about, you know, doing all that, even on old Polaroids. Remember Polaroids? My mother would write on the back of each picture, write the, the date and the occasion. And then there are these images and I'm like, wow. But then there's more. So I want to go through the whole process of, of, of showing, you know, these images to my family here in Japan, my family around the world. Um, I want to share them, but they're, like, they're precious pictures. So you don't want to take those pictures away because uh, you want to make sure they, they last and stay perfect. So how do you do that? Well, let me tell you about my father. As a child, my father's hobby was photography. And he took pictures of us doing all kinds of things. And he shot a lot of slides, transparencies. And he would take these pictures and put them in a projector. And the family, we go into the living room and watch the pictures on a screen or on the wall sometimes. And I remember those memories and they were special. So I asked my mother, like, you know, do you guys still have these pictures? My mom says, yes. 
So I pull out my father's old slides and my father comes and says, what are you doing? I'm like, I'm gonna digitize all your old pictures. He's like, how are you gonna do that? So I showed him and I went doing the process of finding all his old Kodachrome slides. This is me as a kid on slide film, holding a picture of a car, you know, little boys where we just love cars, still love cars. <laughs> So I found all these old slides and then I digitized them. I put them into on one and made them feel like this image. Now this actual image is actually a color slide image, but I wanted to give it more of a feeling of being like an old picture. Now the slides are in pretty decent shape. This one has some, you know, some aging around it, but to be honest, I love that because it shows me the, the, the history of this image is old, it's weathered. I mean, even the Kodachrome slide itself, you know, this transparency holder looks old. And I personally, I love it, but I want to capture these images and bring them into this new age and give them this old feel. So I go into old, I go into on one and I, I tweak them a little bit. And I'll show you how to do that in a little bit as well. But I'll first show you how I digitize all my father's old transparencies as well. I found all these old pictures, you know, some I left black, some I turned black and white, some I kept color and add a little like, you know, hue to it and gave it a little edge. And I love that about that. So this is my my older sister, me in the middle and my, my younger sister uh, on the end at one Christmas in, 1969, you know, and here we are older. And this is a point when we had moved from New York to the South and we're now in South Carolina. And I think we went down to Florida to, you know, to, to Disney World. And uh, I'm not sure how old I'm at this picture, but here I am, you know, and I remember this moment. I remember actually that top. I remember that top. So seeing these pictures just like was just like going back in time for me. Now, Normally when I am taking pictures and I have, I have a lot of slides as well. Uh, in my career, I was shooting a lot of film. I've been shooting for over 30 years. So I have a lot of slide film as well. So I bought a device to digitize all my old slides. And again, I have a lot of them, but I brought some of my, old, my father's old pictures back with me because I want to uh, continue digitizing them. And then I'll take them back. The next time I go back to the States, I'll take them back and give them back to my father along with a hard drive with those pictures on them so we can send them everywhere. So when I digitize images here in Japan, this is what I use. I'll, I'll always have a can of air so I can dust off any dust that's on them. And I use this device. This is a, a Nikon ES2 uh, digitizing device. You need a certain lens for this one. You need to have, um, what's recommended actually is to have the Nikon, I'll stop for sharing for just for one second so I can show this part of this. Well, actually I'll, I'll stop sharing in a second. You get to use a, a, a 60 millimeter lens for it, a, a macro lens or micro lens, and that attaches to the front element of this device. You put your slides in and you can digitize all the images. Now you do need to have a light for this. So the best light that I, or the one light that I love using is a loom cube. And the loom cube is small enough, you know, you, you could have, put it on a tripod and put it where you want to have it right in front of your camera. And this becomes your light device to, to give um, luminance to your images as you shoot. So, you can do both slides and negatives. I know many of us have negatives as well. So with this device, you have a holder for slides and for negatives. I can put a whole sheet of negatives, like five, a strip of negatives in as well and go through and digitize all these images and then in post, turn them from negative to positive. You can do all that today very easily. So if you have old negatives, old slides, Turn them into digital images. It's easy to do today. And that's so cool. Now, this is another version showing you, and I'm just at this point, just doing slides. So I want to show you that part 
I have a tripod. My camera's on a tripod. I have another small uh, mini tripod for my Loom Cube. The Loom Cube is very close, and this is a over the top version. My Loom Cube is very close to my lens. So here you can see it from the top to see the device as it attaches to that 60 millimeter lens. And you see the slide carrier, give you a good feeling for how this, how this works. And I do have this beside me, I can show you that er uh, later on to show you the exact product and how it works. So this is what I'm normally doing. I'll have uh, uh, my phone and I'm usually listening to a, a podcast as I'm going through and just digitizing all these slides. So you go through, maybe you'll do, you know, 50 or 100. So I'll play something on my on my phone, like a, a podcast usually, and just go through and digitize all my images. Very simple, easy to do. But of course, there is a cost to buying the Nikon uh, film digitizing uh, device. Um, it's called an ES2. And that's great. It's absolutely great. I love it. But I didn't take that with me to uh, visit my family in the South. You know, so 7,000 miles away, I fly to South Carolina from, uh, from Tokyo, see my family, and I'm like, okay, how am I gonna take these pictures and turn them into digital? I, mean, I can't just leave here and not digitize these images. I'm not sure when I'll be back again. I was last home to see my family in 2019. We don't know what the future holds. So I want to make sure I digitize these images right now. So I got to work taking these pictures. This is me and my older sister. And this is when we were back in New York City. Uh, I guess it had to be during winter at some point. <laughs> Here I am at a birthday blowing out my candles and my younger sister is beside me looking at me uh, blowing out the candles. I never saw this picture before until I went home this past, uh, this past trip. And here, all three of us all together, there's me and my, my two sisters, my younger sister and my older sister all together. Um, it was special seeing these pictures for the first time for me, the same way it would be special for you seeing pictures from when you were a child, when you were a baby, when you were less than a year old and, and in your early stages of life, your first seven years. So maybe you don't want to go through the process of, of getting that uh, official device uh, made by Nikon. Maybe you shoot with a Canon or a Sony or a Fuji or there are all so many, there's so many different types of cameras out there. So I want to show you a way that you can digitize your pictures and it's very inexpensive. So I was in the South and I'm trying to figure out what I can do to take these pictures and bring, bring new life into the images. So here's a slide, and this is actually showing what it looks like as I'm looking down on the images for this one. So for this process, you'll need a few things. You'll need a light. I did not have a light with me down south, so I ran out to Best Buy and got a, a cheap, inexpensive light. Uh, this is just a simple, LED panels, like the size of your phone, actually. Um, any light will do, but I think this one's kind of cool to have a simple, uh, this is actually a, a digi power small little light here that I use for this. Super, super simple, super light. And I will say it's like maybe 40 bucks, 30 bucks, something, it was, didn't cost a lot at all. Um, then I use a simple glass. We all have one, you know. A simple glass, I turn it upside down and I'll show you exactly how I use this. And you need a sheet of, uh, of tissue, Kleenex tissue, that's it. So you need your light, a glass and Kleenex tissue, super, super simple. That's all you need to digitize your images and of course your camera. Oh, of course, one more thing, a tripod. You've got to have your tripod for this. So those are the items that you need. Um, and of course, your camera, you need your camera and it's best to have some type of macro lens. Maybe it's a 100 macro or 105 macro, depending on the camera you use or, uh, or a 60 macro. Uh, you definitely need some type of macro lens. The best one for the Nikon system is the 60 millimeter macro. That one is absolutely amazing to do what I'm about to show you. So 
what I love about this little digi powered light, I can change the, the, the Kelvin on it to make it daylight. You can go from either 5500K to make it very uh, cool or go to 3200 Kelvin to make it very warm. So for all these pictures, I took it to 5500K Kelvin to daylight. So the first thing I do is I turn the cup upside down and I wrap tissue around the light. So if you think about, um, for those of you who use strobe lights, if you think about a soft box, I'm in essence making a soft box from this light. Yeah, maybe you have a, a, a strobe light which has a, a light dome around it. With a light, with a soft box, you put a cover over the over the light. Um, there's usually like maybe two panels of covers to make that light very soft and even and beautiful. Well, in essence, I'm doing that with this light. Uh, sorry, with my with my with my cup, and I'm putting Kleenex tissue around it. I had the top part, which is flat, to place my my uh, my chrome on, and then I have my camera. So on my tripod, I place my camera on the tripod and you need a decent tripod where, I can, where you can take it and print it all the way down. So I'm shooting directly on top of the image. Now with the EZ2 um, device, I'm, I'm shooting you know straight into the image. Here I'm shooting down on the image. So I have my 60 millimeter macro lens. I'm using a Z62 here for, for this image. And I have uh, my uh, adapter on as well for that lens. And I'm gonna come closer than I am on this picture. I wanna show you this one to show you how the distance to show you the, the cup, the, the Kleenex, the slide and the camera and the tripod. But I come down very, very close to the image with why you need the macro lens so you can get just the image. And with the 60 millimeter macro, this is perfect. I can come really close and get the full image in my viewfinder. And then I have my light off to the side. Now I'll place it where I want to be. I'll take that light, I have it turned on now, it's at 5,500 degrees Kelvin. And I'll place my light right in front of that. So I had the tissue there in the front. I place my light there so it's a diffused light source. You don't want to have the light directly on your slide. You want to have this illumination of light that gives you this, this beautiful, even light. So this was working really, really well for me. So I bring the light very close here. And I bring my lens down where it's just filling that image in my viewfinder. And now I'm ready to go. So this shows you exactly how much I'm seeing with that 60 millimeter lens. I am so tight, I get all of the image. And I love this way. Now, when I'm using the easy adapter, I'm not this close. I'm a little further back with the easy device. So either way works, whatever way you want, um, the, the high end way, or, or the DIY version where you're doing it yourself version, where you, you know, take a cup from home and put some Kleenex tissue, get a small light, you know, the, your expenses, you know, 30, 40 bucks to buy the light. We all have a glass cup. I'm sure you all have Kleenex. Super simple to do this. You do need that macro micro lens to do this for sure, because you need to be close and tight. And for this one, the 60 is absolutely perfect. So here I'm shooting ISO 200, I'm a 4.8, uh, one one hundredth of a second uh, for this image. That light's pretty bright, as you can tell here. I'm only at ISO 200. So that's a lot of light coming there for this shot. And then I go to work, just taking it one frame at a time and digitizing my father's old slides. And I absolutely love this process. So this is what that slide looks like on top of the glass. So here you have the glass. You see uh, this illumination of, of, of the image from that light. Uh, the Kleenex is giving me this nice uh, light behind it. It's quite nice and I really love it. So this is what it looks like when I put it into on one. So I want to now go through and show you the process of how I go through and digitize all my image. Let's do a live edit for a second. But I first just want to stop sharing for one second and show you exactly the tools that I've used for a moment.
again, I use a Nikon Z6. Uh, this is Z6 II. I have on uh, my 60 millimeter lens. I have on my um, easy adapter for my lens to, to turn this lens into uh, a lens for my, for my uh, mirrorless camera. I do like shooting where I can see the image in the back using my viewfinder. And you can use a remote as well if you want to, so you're not touching the camera to get any kind of shake. Um, I didn't have my adapter, my remote in South Carolina with me. So I was actually hand holding it, but you can use an adapter and I would suggest using that so you don't get any shake with the camera when you are taking those images. Or shooting at a higher ISO so you don't have uh, you know, that any shake at all in the body as well. You definitely want to have a, a great sturdy tripod. Again, I used a uh, you know, simple drinking glass. Kleenex and super simple, inexpensive light. I bought this light when I was down south, uh, super simple. When I was doing the version with the uh, easy adapter, the ES2, I used a Loom Cube as my main source of light. And this one's much brighter than this. So if you want to say, if you want to use one source, I would actually say this, this is more expensive, the Loom Cube, but this is extremely bright and powerful. So I would suggest this light over this simple light. But if you wanna save money, this one's cheaper for sure. Okay, so now let's get to business and making these images come to life. I'm gonna share my screen again, and we are gonna actually go through the process of taking these images and turning them into these old, um, old style, beautiful images. So let me again share my screen for one second here. There we are. So I've chosen a few images that I like already. Let me move my little part out the way here. So I'll start with this image because I just showed you guys that picture. So we'll start with this one first. I'll first go through, select the image and I'll go in on one to the edit module. So right away, the first thing I need to do is crop out my, my transparency uh, holder there. I wanna go through and I'll go to the crop tool here. And I have it on, on free form because you know some of these old pictures that my father had, um, some of them were like a different format that I've never seen before. Uh, they're different sizes that I didn't have, maybe that we won't have today. So I'll go to free form and I'll go through and take my crop tool and take it just where I have my image. Now I do want to keep all those little sprockets that are in there from, uh, I guess, age time. I want to keep that in there. So I'll bring and get my image just right about there. That, that feels good to me just like that. And then I'll go apply to apply my crop. Then I have my image I can work with. Now, this is how I shot it. And today our tools are so powerful. I can actually go through and change my exposure. I can open it up a little bit there. I can even go to the shadows and open the shadows just a tad. Yeah, that looks better. Right there, I kind of like that. All I've done is a small adjustment. Now, my father shot transparency film. And for those of you who shot transparency, you know you had to be on the money for your exposures. So some of my father's slides, they were a little underexposed. No problem. I can adjust those old transparencies so simple and so easily by just using my sliders and you know adjust the exposure. So now this picture now is a better exposure than the original taken almost 60 years ago, you know, 50 odd years ago. <laughs> Amazing. I think this is just groundbreaking to go through and be able to see things that I can't see in the original. I couldn't really see the desk so much, but looking at this desk, my parents still have that furniture. Believe it or not, this is still in my parents' home um, that they drug down from New York to South Carolina, it's still there. As a matter of fact, this desk is where I found my father's old slides. So for me, this picture 
has so much meaning beyond just me standing there holding this cutout of a car. That desk is still in my parents' house. And this is why I talk about like, you know, the, the picture is important to us today, but in the, tomorrow, the picture and everything in the picture will be important to you. So let's go through now and change this picture around a little bit. I wanna go through now and uh, move this out the way. I'm gonna go through and go to my effects panel. This is where we first start having some fun. So I'm gonna go through, this is an old picture. I wanna get that older feeling now. I can keep the color in if I want to. And I think I will for this one. I'll keep the color like it is, but I give it a little twist to it. So first I wanna do is go to vintage and give it more of that feel that I think pictures from that time had. So here I'm going to vintage filter, give it that little twist, give it that feel from like, you know, so it looks like 1960. I love the ruggedness of this image. And because of that, I want to give it a little bit, well, let's first go through and add a little bit of contrast, just a bit, a little pinch there is nice. I also wanna go through and add a little bit of vignetting, not a lot, but just a tad. So I'll go to vignette, I'll give it a little bit there. We can go a little more possibly. Oh, that's too much. Let's go back to more subtle. There, that looks good. I'm liking this already a lot, but there's one more thing I wanna add to it. I wanna go through and add a border. Now that's one border. That's, you know, looks nice and clean, but I think it's too clean for this time. This is the 60s. I want to give it a different feel. So I'm going to go to, mm, I can go to a white border. I can go to a sloppy border. I can go to an instant border, like, like you know, from an old Polaroid. I can go to just the emotion. But I'm going to go to a sloppy border. There we are. But oh, let's see if I can change to a different one. That one's a little bit, let's go. That looks nice. Maybe that's a little bit too much. Yeah, that looks good. Right there. Now I have my image the way I like it. Love this. And I can just go export this picture, put it where I want it to be. Uh, it's going to load up. And I've now turned my old picture and brought it to life. I export it, put it where I want it to be. In this case, I put it on my, my external hard drive. And now I have this picture I brought to life and I can send this picture now to my parents right from here. As a matter of fact, I bought a, a, a digital frame that I can upload pictures from here in Japan to my parents' uh, home in South Carolina. I can, I can email the pictures or update the pictures from here and put these on their digital frame. So even like five minutes from now, they can have this picture and be looking at it on their digital frame. I love that. And that's what I'm gonna do today after the session. I'm gonna send all these pictures that I'm doing with you guys to my parents and surprise them. They don't even know this yet. <laughs> Let's do another picture here. I'll go back to browse for a second. And I'll go through and uh, I'll do this picture of my sister, my older sister and I, uh, when we were back in New York. Now the color on this is nice, but I think I wanna give it a more of a black and white feel. So let's try playing around with that. I first go through again, go to my, tr my crop tool. Again, I have on free form. You have options here. You can go to the to the original ratio uh, of the image. You can go to square if you're doing like for like say you're going to do something for like Instagram. You can go to square or anything you want to do. But I'm gonna go to free form. As my is my style. I'm going to take my cursor and just come to the edges to fill that just where I want to be. right there in Brooklyn, New York. And I'm going to go apply first to apply that, that crop. Now we can start working on this image. This is funny for me to see this image. Uh, I first go through and let's take the color out of it. Let's, let's try and see what it looks like without any color. I go to black and white. 
Yeah, that's kind of cool. Now you have a lot of options here. We can go to black and white. I've never done this before, but let's see in a different vintage also. Let's see. Oh, now that's kind of cool. Kind of like sepia tone. Now that's kind of cool. I like that one. Let's go to sepia tone. Again, I want to go through and I want to add another filter. I'm going to go through and add a little bit of vignetting so I can just, uh, not, I'm sorry, not, not, I went to vintage again. I want to add, instead of going to vintage a second time, I want to go to vignette. There we are. Okay. And let's try, I'll go a little bit more on, on the uh, stronger version of my vignette or the lighter, maybe the lighter still. The lighter's kind of nice, looks natural there. The attention comes right to us. I like that for sure. I think I will give us a little more contrast as well. There's a little pop there. Yeah, that's nice. If it's a little bit too much, I can take it down. You have these little sliders here to adjust your contrast. So I'll go in the you know, small, medium and large amounts of contrast. I'll go to my, there. That's that's nice. That's cool like that. Beautiful. I think that's kind of cool right there. So I now like the feeling of this, but again, I want to add another border to it. So let's go to a different type of border. And I'm going to now go to an instant type of border. Yeah, now this is like an old, like, you know, four by five. You have other options here for these instant film versions and you can make it look like a, a 35 millimeter uh, image, like a negative around it. That's kind of nice. You have all these options within, you know, on one. And I love that about these. You can make it look like, you know, it's a really old picture. Uh, it's totally up to you, but this is so much fun. I love this one. I love this one. This looks like the old Polaroids that you pull and then you get that little, uh, you know, the film gunk on the sides. I love that one. That one looks kind of cool. You have a lot of versions within on one. And I love that they have these. Here we have like an old four by five with the film strip. For those who shot four by five or eight by 10, this is what it looks like to have the film sprockets. So I love you have all these options to use as, as borders to take us back and really make the, it feel like you know, something special. I'm gonna go back, I think, to that feel. That looks kind of nice. Let's go with that for a second to give that old film feel. And I think this one is, is done for the most part. I love this one. And again, I'll go and export this one. And that one looks good to me. Okay, I'll put again, you know, into my uh, hard drive there. I'm gonna stop sharing for one second. And I know you probably have a lot of questions. So I wanna now open the door um, this last 15 minutes to, to go into questions. Let's talk about um, any questions you might have about the gear, maybe the, 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 the light or the, or the camera, the lens I chose, or anything else you wanna talk about in terms of taking your old pictures and bring them back to life. That sounds great, Matthew. Um, so we do have a few questions. Let me see if I can get my video working here. Of course, it craps out right when I'm <laughs> trying to show myself. It might just be I the, more pictures the, also. Yeah, I got the, a few more I want to do there, so. No worries. It's just going to be the laptop camera, so I guess I can't get the one up there working. But uh, That's fine. so um, a big question here. Um, what is the benefit to shooting with a camera to capture the slide versus actually scanning it in with a scanner? Ah, oh, the benefit would be definitely uh, doing it faster, I think. Okay. Uh, if you have a lot of images, uh, like I have a scanner as well, but the process of scanning is a much slower process. Now, there are great scanners out there for sure. Uh, and if you wanna do like, if you're doing one scan or two scans, that might be great. If you have 200 pictures you want to digitize, it's a different story. Yeah, so, cause I guess you could just have the light and then just take a photo. Exactly. Take yeah. yeah. It's much faster. For sure. The getting process of me, like I probably did maybe, I probably did a hundred pictures while I was down South. Oh, wow. You know, 
So that process was fairly easy. My father was sitting beside me, amazed, watching, seeing me, That's you know, awesome. make my DIY version of, you know, this digitizing device and shooting yeah. this. Um, for a scanner, you've got to have a lot more information. You've got to have, you know, your scanner, your computer. It's just a bigger, it's a much more involved process for sure. For sure, for sure. Um, another question about when you're shooting with the camera, are you shooting in raw and what are your camera settings looking like? Great, great, great. Yes, I am shooting in raw. Okay. Absolutely. Um, my camera settings with this was, I, I was on actually on uh, auto white balance for this one. I didn't go crazy in trying to get the, <laughs> you know, balance. Now I'm a meter person. I, I use a light meter. I use a color meter for all of my, my images in, in real life when I'm shooting. But for this, I had on auto white balance. I wasn't going crazy. I had a low ISO. I do like having my native ISO for my camera because you'll get the best <laughs> files always shooting your camera's native ISO. For my Z72, it's 64. For the Z62, it's ISO 100. So that's the best files I'll get from those cameras. And every camera out there, your native ISO will give you the best files that you can get. So sure. I always want to be there for my ISO. And then I want to have as much light as possible. So the, the loom cube will definitely give me a lot more light in terms of looms versus my uh, digi light. That was a much cheaper light. And it gives you decent light, but it's not the power of this loom cube. There, I love those loom cubes. So do I. I, I just got my first so one like I. a couple months ago and I love it, yeah. Yeah, this, this little thing is a great investment super great investment i think every photographer should have a loom cube honestly even if you're like just you know need a little bit of light on the subject you can just hold it hold absolutely it. yeah and they even they even make this little small like snoot and grid for this oh geez which is insane yeah, it's wild. i mean this this little light is super powerful and super fun you can throw this in your bag i mean i should have had this light in my camera bag when i went home but i didn't i will from now on for sure because yeah <laughs> makes everything handy uh, another, question, another question here um do you do any cleaning of the slide before you digitize it if so uh how do you clean the slide yes i do now i don't want to do anything that's going to like uh destroy the the image at all so i don't want to touch it touch it but i will use a can of air to blow off any dust on the image but i don't want to do too much especially these images that are so old. I oh, don't yeah. want to like brush them or anything like that at all. So I'm just going to use canned air only. Totally. To clean the image. That's, that's it. Totally. The two delicate. Okay. Yeah, for sure. For sure. Um, another, well, I guess it's more of a, a suggestion, but it was going along with on how to keep the camera steady. And someone suggested, because you suggested a remote and someone suggested to um, use the self timer if you have one on your camera. To make sure oh, that's actually a good uh, point yeah. there's there's uh, two options actually there's a self timer and there's also if you use a uh, nikon there you the is, right there's the app so mm -hmm. you can shoot from the app mm -hmm. and uh it's funny because i didn't do that while i was doing that at home i was somewhere with my father and i'm showing my father how i can use the app to take pictures with the phone yeah and he was blown away <laughs> oh my god yeah, click so that's shutter. actually a great idea as well using yeah. the app to take the pictures versus touching the actual shutter Mm -hmm. And most digital cameras these days have a, yeah, an app that you can connect to. Yeah, exactly. All right. Thanks for that saying that because I, I totally forgot about that. And I should have done that when I was down south to take those pictures that way. For sure. Um, a few other, I mean, these are, there's a couple questions about this. Will this work with negatives? Absolutely. Okay. Sweet. Absolutely. Um, I do feel better with negatives using the the EZS uh, device. You know, let me just quickly show this for a second. So, what I love about negatives with this device, there are two holders. One's made for your chromes for your for your slides. Like this one puts your slides in. Super simple. As a matter of fact, I can. Just go through and throw your slide in there. Fits right in, super simple. Nice. So I like that, but also the other holder, this one's made for your negatives. 
So you can put a whole strip inside and just oh, go nice. through and put the entire strip through. So this is for negatives. Okay. So for negatives, I would say a device like this is better. Okay. I, would f- I wouldn't feel as comfortable doing my DIY version with negatives. As okay. we all know, the negs are super, super fragile. Exactly. Um, where the chromes feel a little more sturdy and uh, you know, it's, it's that, that transparency with a negative, you can, you know, a little bit of anything on it and it's done. So I'd feel better having this around my negs and, and putting it through for sure. For sure. Yeah, that seems like a more practical solution. Um, a couple of people had questions about organizing your digitized images. Do you use metadata or any keywords or anything like that? For Absolutely, organizing? absolutely. I try to put them in um, close to being, like my mother was really good about putting uh, information on the back of, of actual pictures, but for the slides, there's nothing on them. So I'm trying to figure out when was this taken? So I'll put down, oh, circa 1965, 1967, 1969. Yeah. I'm trying to figure out a time frame. And I'm even asking my parents, when was this picture taken? <laughs> you know, so I'm trying to have that in my, in my archive. So I have, yeah. I have a NAS, um, I've got an 80 terabyte NAS. Oh, geez. So yeah, I have, so I have all my, all, I have my entire life broken down 60s, 70s, 80s and I go through from the 80s I go through versus you know year by year yeah from my career so I start have my entire career broken down in years all the way up so as I shoot I start with the the month the day and the year so that's my filing okay. system and going back I'm trying slowly to put those old pictures in there as well and that's that awesome that's awesome that sounds like great and I'm trying to actually my, my plan is also to put a NAS in my parents home so I have a backup. I have two backups here in the States and I have other hard drives in a, another location here in Tokyo, but I live in Japan. This is yeah. early century. And exactly. I got to have another NAS in the States with everything's another backup. So my plan is to have a second NAS at my parents' home with everything on it as well. That's a smart <laughs> idea. You never know. You never, you know. never know. You never know. Um, next question. You might have answered this. I can't remember. When you were talking about your camera settings, did you mention the aperture? Oh, I did not. So I was shooting, I think around like, um, I think 4.85 F5 possibly okay. is where I was shooting for the most part. Um, I'm assuming just a kind sweet of, spot. Yeah, maximizing the, the ISO, I'm assuming. Exactly. Whatever it gives you pretty much probably. True, okay. true. So I was shooting on, on this one, I was shooting at aperture priority. So I let my light, <laughs> more light to come in there, but I the wanted German. to stay... Definitely at you know my native ISO for sure. I didn't want I wouldn't crank it up at all. So I want to bring as much light as I could in there. Okay. Um, and shoot. And real quick, way. just we have we do have a couple of questions on the native ISO. I didn't mean to interrupt you, but do you oh, want yes, to just yeah, go yeah. expand on that a little bit? Yes. So every camera has like when you shot film, we had this whole thing of like the lower the ISO, the the better quality the image would be. Like my father shot a lot of Kodachrome twenty five. Remember that film? Um, a quarter chrome 64. So the lower the ISO, the better quality it would be. With digital, it's not quite that way. So every camera manufacturer has a native ISO and it changes from, from camera to camera. Like um, with my D850 uh, and my Z7, it might be 64, but with the Z6, it's ISO 100. Another camera, it might be ISO 200. So the higher the ISO doesn't mean it's better uh, in terms or not as good in terms of your, your image quality. You want to be at the native ISO for that camera's manufacturer. So in your manual, when you first buy your camera, it will say what the native ISO for your camera is. So your best images, your best files will come from you shooting at your native ISO. Perfect. That sounds great. Yeah. Quick Google or looking in your... Yes, yes, yes. Yep. The quick Google search would yep. like tell you your native ISO for your camera. Perfect. Um, last question here. Um, we're almost uh, to four, so um, kind of off topic, but a couple of people were asking how you enjoy living in Tokyo. I absolutely love it. Oh, so I can I can talk for hours about this. <laughs> I know we were just chatting <laughs> it up for about twenty minutes before we started. Yes, living in Japan is amazing. It's, it's funny now because. For the last year, there have been no tours here. So it's, it's only people who only people who are here now are either residents like me 
or or uh, you no know, or nationals um, citizens. And what's great about that it's it's not as busy as it normally is. I you'll never see Japan like this. Like I went to Kyoto a couple of times um, during this pandemic, and it's absolutely empty. So you can walk oh around God. these amazing temples, these amazing places, and there's nobody there. That's perfect. That will never happen again. Kyoto is no. probably the most the busiest place in Japan for sure. It's packed with tourists yeah. all the time to the point where people from Japan don't want to go there because it's so packed yeah. all the time. And right now it's not. You can walk around these famous places and there's nobody there. And it's absolutely amazing. Um, That's awesome. But there's, there's so many great things about uh, Japan. Number one, the season. Yeah. You know, experiencing the seasons as they come. I've never seen it like they come here. Um, you know, I lived in, in I lived in New York. I lived in South Carolina. I lived in L.A. So I've seen the change of different places, but not like here. Seasons come here like clockwork. You've all heard about really? uh, the cherry blossom season, <clears throat> the Kura season, mm -hmm. um, but that's the beginning of spring and beginning of this 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 season of flowers where one comes in and goes out. Another comes in and goes out. And right now we are at the beginning of uh, Ajisai season, um, which will turn to the rainy season in a month. And it will Is that rain. your winter? Is that your winter? No, it's not. Oh, no, you have actually it's winter? Like, it's, we have a winter for sure. Okay. But there are like five seasons in Japan. Oh, geez. You got, you know, spring, summer, winter, fall, and the rainy season. Oh, okay. Okay. So the, June is the rainy season and it comes like clockwork where it rains like, almost every single day. And with the rain comes um, Ajisai, which is uh, Ajisai, the flower Ajisai is a uh, hydrangea. Oh, and okay. they are everywhere. They're bigger than I've ever seen anywhere. And they are beautiful. I can't even and they're imagine. all over. That's awesome. They're all over there if you watch any old japanese movies you see them everywhere also you'll see the seasons change in a movie uh i'm a big kurosawa fan so all his movies they they tell the seasons in the movie uh and you see that a lot in a lot of japanese movies so sorry about that's that not, I in order about japan. no you're good that's that sounds awesome man that, that's what they wanted to hear um real quick another question more of a request from people would you mind putting together a little list of the the hardware that you use absolutely um, absolutely in the process that'd be awesome and then we'll just probably put that in the recording in the uh yeah in the description beautiful i can do that in one second that sounds great man <laughs> cool. well thank you so much i really appreciate you joining us today that was awesome information and really great way to digitize your old uh old film shots yeah and bring them to life for sure thank ah, you guys thanks so, so much, much time. uh have fun taking pictures of your old pictures and bringing those to life